my very first orchestra piece, a piece called Common Tones in Simple Time, which I composed in, I guess it was 1979. I paid for the parts and the production with a, with a commission from the National Endowment for the Arts, so I can say that they were instrumental in getting me going. I remember very clearly that the NEA was giving out small grants to a lot of composers. So uh, I've been living in the San Francisco Bay Area for 40 years or so, and I remember that month that it, not only was it prestigious to those of us who were emerging, to use a kind word, many of us were completely unknown. And of course, you know, just the money was very helpful in my case producing an orchestra piece and getting the parts copied and all the materials duplicated. Uh, I forget what the grant was for. It was maybe $2,500 or something, but that was, that was big news in those days. There, there are people who feel that if an artist's work doesn't pay for itself, there's something wrong with it. And anyone who's got even the remotest knowledge about cultural history knows that many of the greatest works of art, whether they're Beethoven symphonies or Michelangelo sculptures or poetry or whatever, was the result of enlightened patronage. And art very often doesn't pay for itself. So you know, we as artists are always looking for support. We're looking for some form of patronage because what we do, it can't compete in the marketplace with material that is, is made strictly for profit. Arts, unfortunately, are frequently the, the first political football that you get whenever there's a you know, an argument about budget. But if you look at the economy, particularly in a city like San Francisco, where I live, the arts really are, they're a real generator of revenue and, and civic activity. You know, the activity around a concert hall, for example, Davies Hall in San Francisco, it's buzzing. And the fact that people come into the city and go to these concerts and have dinner in the neighborhood Frequently, it's the arts that are responsible for enormous upswings in neighborhoods. The bottom line is that music is fundamentally about feeling. Obviously, we get great intellectual and, and sensory pleasure from music. But the most important aspect, the most powerful issue or thing about, about music is that it is feeling. It's raw feeling, which one person communicates to another, either by composing it or singing it or performing it. There's something about just being in the presence of that raw emotion that, that you get when you hear an opera or a Mahler symphony or a Beethoven piano concerto that uh, has intense meaning for people. Art is as varied and as different experiences as individual people are. What's wonderful about art is it can be as different as all the people on the planet. You go to a, like a big airport or maybe go to a, a baseball stadium and you look around and you see 10,000 or 20 or 30,000 people and each one of those people has a different story to tell, a different DNA, a different inclination. So there's going to be a different kind of art for each one of these people. When I was in the third grade, it was 1956, and it was the 200th anniversary of Mozart's birth. 
And we had a very, very sophisticated teacher in this little school where I went, and she read to the class a child's biography of Mozart. And uh, I do very clearly remember being completely jazzed by that idea of a, a little boy who could write symphonies and concertos. And so I, I went home and tried to do that. And of course, you know, realized immediately that I didn't have the technical equipment. But my parents were very sensitive and very perceptive. And they found me a teacher. There was actually somebody within a half hour drive of where we lived who could teach me to write melodies and eventually harmony and counterpoint. I consider myself essentially a composer who conducts, and I've, I've never at any point in my life ever had a confusion about that. Mostly I learned conducting just by watching other conductors, and that's frequently the case. You can learn the basics of you know, how to beat six and four and five, but most everything else has to do with your, as we say, uh, on-the-job training. You have to get out there in front of the orchestra and make your mistakes and just do it over and over again and, and always listen. I will say, though, that my experience of playing in an orchestra when I was younger, I, I substituted with the Boston Symphony while I was still undergraduate at Harvard. It gave me a very special insight into what, what it's like on the other side of the podium, what it's like to be in an orchestra where your part only gives you a fraction of information as to what's going on. And I'm unusually sensitive to uh, the sort of collective psychology uh, of you know 80 or 100 musicians and uh, I think more than anything else, musicians, well, they want to be inspired, but they also don't want to have their time wasted. People understand when something's necessary, and then they also know when, when a conductor's wasting their time. I look at a group of musicians and think, okay, if Malcolm Gladwell's uh, theory that it takes 10,000 hours to master anything is true, then if I'm standing in front of 50 musicians, that's... Uh, 500,000 hours of collective time in a practice room. So when you think about that, you have to be somewhat awed and, and full of respect for uh, the people you're working with. You know, we're now in a period where the tonality uh, in much of the country is anti-government, keep the government out of our lives, et cetera, et cetera. But in fact, you know, I, I've been a strong believer that um, government can be instrumental in people's lives and uh, that while support from the private sector is obviously the main route in a market economy like ours, that having the imprimatur and the support of foundations that our government sponsored is a tremendously important thing. And it, it affirms who we are as artists, that we're not just ivory tower people who are disassociated with society, but we're, we're a part of the society. And, and I, I remember going to Washington and serving on an NEA panel and looking at uh, compositions that were coming in from everywhere, from Alaska and, and the Dakotas and Georgia, as well as New York and San Francisco, and, and feeling that I re really was uh, a citizen and really part of uh, a large entity, uh, an organism. And I think that the people I know who work at the NEA are are just wonderful, wonderful people They're devoted to their jobs and to what the endowment does in the country. The National Endowment for the Arts serves for me as an artist, two functions. One is support, financial support, which is obviously critical for the arts. But the other, which in some ways is even more important, is the imprimatur, the knowledge that the people of the country who are being represented through this government foundation, that they are 
proud of their artists and that the National Endowment exists because we have a, a great culture, we always have, and it continues to be rich, and that by receiving support from the National Endowment for the Arts uh, makes me, as an American composer, feel that I'm a part of my society and what I do is profoundly valued. <laughs>